Here's what you need to do. You've got to first shave your head. You dress all in black. You've got to wear a white robe. Eat only kosher foods. You've got to become a vegetarian. You face Jerusalem. You've got to face India when you pray. You pray only in Hebrew and you grow a nice big beard. And if you do all of those outward cultural things, you'll discover the God of the universe. And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, he should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible, the New Testament, and that they were two completely separate books. Because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and it's something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not the person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible. Okay, so we have a story of a Jewish man who encounters Jesus. Um, and actually the reading we had um, was um, about, Isaiah 50, uh, about Isaiah 9. And it was a, a reading which talked about someone who was going to come. And you know, scattered throughout the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, are pictures of someone who will come, an anointed one, a savior, a deliverer, the Messiah, great David's greater son, the son of David. These are all titles for the Messiah. And it's interesting, we call these messianic prophecies. And God put those pictures in the Old Testament to prepare the Jewish people, to prepare them to recognize the Messiah when he came. He didn't want to leave it as an obscure thing. He wanted to make it very clear. The Jewish people needed to recognize their Messiah. And actually, that's what happened. A lot of people did recognize Jesus as a Messiah, except for people who were too wealthy, too settled in their ways, for people who were too powerful, too obsessed with their grip on power, or people who were too tied down to sort of religious traditions. They didn't want to give them up. 
Actually, there were large crowds that flocked to Jesus. He was very popular. But you know, in Scripture, there are two strands of prophecy. There are prophecies about a priestly Messiah and a kingly Messiah. And what a lot of Jewish people at the time of Jesus were hoping was that he would become, he would come and he'd be a king and he'd be conquering and victorious. He would be great David's greatest son. He would sit on the throne, etc., and liberate them from the Romans. Okay, that's what they were hoping. But I think we need to distinguish between the prophecies that speak of a priestly Messiah. This would be a Messiah who would make atonement for the sins of a nation. He would offer himself as the sacrifice. I mean, that was the job of a priest, to pray for the people and to offer sacrifices to atone for their sins. He would be a suffering servant. That's one strand. And then the second strand is the kingly Messiah, who would basically defeat the enemies of Israel and bring peace. And a lot of Jewish people are put off by the fact that actually he didn't fill that, fulfill that. Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. He didn't bring peace. Okay? But actually what we know is he needed to come twice. He needed to come first to deal with sins. And then he is coming another time in the future as the conquering king. He will be a glorious and victorious king who will conquer all the enemies and actually usher in the new heavens and the new earth. You know, du during his lifetime, Jesus fulfilled over 300 messianic prophecies in his life. People looking back have discovered in the life of Jesus, there's over 300 messianic prophecies filled, fulfilled. Even King Herod knew where he was going to be born. And King Herod was not exactly a good Jew. Um, and I want to focus first on a prophecy which is not much talked about, but it's actually very important. When we, when we talk about the subject of the covering Messiah and of Jesus fulfilling it, it explains why there was such a high expectancy in the first century. Lots of Jews expected the Messiah to come in the first century, and there were lots of false messiahs. And it's because of this prophecy in the book of Daniel, which is difficult to, to understand, but some of it is really clear. And I'll, I'll read it to you. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy place. You know, there have been prophecies how the second temple was going to be more glorious than the first temple, Solomon's temple. And actually it was, because God visited the second temple. God, in the person of Jesus, anointed the holy place. Know and understand this. From the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And the 62, so after the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, obviously, that happened in the first century. We know it happened. The anointed one came, and he was put to death. And then, 40 years later, the Romans came, and they, as a result of the Jewish rebellion, they destroyed Jerusalem, and the temple was completely destroyed. That happened. And if anybody is expecting the Messiah still to come, it's a hopeless hope. Either the Messiah came in the first century, or the Bible is wrong, and you can forget about the Messianic prophecies. Either it was Jesus, or it was nobody. But actually, the rabbis obscure that for a lot of Jewish people. They don't see that. However, you, it is slightly obscure in that there were several decrees to restore um, Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city. 
There were several decrees, so it's sometime in the first century, and I think God built that ambiguity in. But however you do the Mass, in the first century, the Messiah would come. He would provide atonement for sin, he would bring in everlasting righteousness, and he would be put to death. And all of that would happen before the first temple was destroyed, before the second temple was destroyed. And that happened in AD 70. Messiah would have to do all that. And he did. That was Jesus. The other thing I want to point out is that when you talk about great David's greatest son, David was both a priest and a king. There's a passage in uh, um, Psalm 104, uh, 100 verse 4. Psalm 100 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now that was originally spoken to David, but actually it was also spoken to his greater son. And it's a prophecy for the future. And the In the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews applies this multiple times to Jesus. He says, our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And you see it also, this whole theme of the the suffering servant, you see it very clearly in a a, a passage called... uh, Psalm 22, it's what Jesus quoted when he, when he was on the cross. He was obviously meditating on, on this is his experience. And I'll read you a couple of bits. What Jesus said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? Further on down, we see, All who see me mock me. They hold insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And further on down, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast my lots for my garment. It's a very clear picture of the suffering that Jesus went through on the cross. And it's there in Psalm 22. But actually, Psalm 22 goes on um, to explain that actually, as a result of the suffering, the whole world is going to be blessed. And we know that's also true. Isaiah also writes about, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. It's a picture of Jesus being suffering, actually giving his body, his precious body, as a, as a sacrifice for us. And lastly, I want to come to Isaiah 53. This Jewish man is going to talk a bit more about the impact of Isaiah 53 on him, but I'll just mention a couple of verses. It's a, it's a picture of the suffering servant. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And as I goes on to speak about his trial, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the ongoing impact of his sacrificial life and his sacrificial death. And it's astonishing how often in 12 verses, 12 times this passage repeats the concept that this was not just meaningless suffering. His suffering had a meaning. The servant was dying for the sins of the people, offering his life right through to the last verse, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made his intercession for the transgressors. There was Jesus, the, the ultimate suffering servant, dying for the, the sins of the entire human race. 
everybody who'd lived before him, who would live after him. He died for us all. And after we've watched the second part of the video, Mary will exp help you to think this through, help you to think what it means to you. Okay. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, w w just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father uh, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. What we're going to do now is just something slightly different. Um, so just to kind of give a bit of a background, we're leading up to something very exciting. We're leading up to Advent, okay? Um, and Advent is interestingly about Jesus coming for the first time, but it's also about Jesus coming for the second time. So this week and next week, Dad and I are going to lead us through some prophecies. Um, and like my dad was talking about just now, this first lot is about Jesus coming as a suffering servant. And um, we're going to read through that again and try and just really get into that place of how he came as a suffering servant. And then next week, we're going to be um, looking at how Jesus came as the conquering king. So there was two sort of lines that we were going to go through in the next two weeks. But all of this is to kind of lead us up to Advent, which is so exciting. Um, so what I'm also going to sort of say is... Um, you know, when we, when, we, when we learn about God, you know, it's very easy to learn it all in our minds and our heads and it's all intellectual and we like to kind of puzzle about things and listen. And my dad's done an incredible job of kind of leading us through what prophecies are and how they work in the Bible and all that kind of stuff, all the head stuff. But what I would hope, or what I would like to do is maybe try and get it to sink into our hearts a little bit this morning. Um, so I'm going to read Isaiah 53 and if you would like to, because we all take it in differently, if you would like to go and grab a Bible, you can, or it's going to be up on the screen, or you can just close your eyes and listen to the word. Okay, so I'll give you a chance if you want to jump up and grab a Bible, because some people like to follow it alongside. Um, and while you're listening, while you're reading, I've got two questions for you to sort of ask yourself and ponder. It's quite helpful to have like something to, to try and focus on. So the first question is where is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, where is the Spirit disrupting you in this passage? What is making you kind of oh, something? The Spirit is making you move. And then the second question is, what is the Spirit confirming to you in this passage? And I'm going to read it out. It's going to take about two minutes. And then I'm going to leave some silence for you just to be with God 
and to think about things. And we might have a time of kind of reflecting back maybe words or pictures or things that people feel like they've heard afterwards. Okay? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry lack ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he look, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet of his generation, who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his land. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. The Lord said, therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Okay. We don't get time much in life, do we, just to sit and be silent and think about God's word. And so, I'm just going to ask the questions again. And if anyone is got something that they would like to say I'd love it if you would like to share so the first question was where is the spirit is did the spirit um, disrupt something within you when you were hearing that or reading it so where is the conflict for you in this passage what made you feel uneasy you've had your nap now it's time to wake up. Okay, so when you were reading that, when you were hearing it, was this something that was like, oh, it like a conflict or a, a niggle inside you? Something that like jolted you? Anything that the Holy Spirit might have said to you in that time? Amazing. Okay, so how are we preparing the way? 
How are we making Jesus known so that people will recognize the second time? Love that. Love that. Yep, yeah, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pause you, so we're going to try and see, get some other um, words in the room. But yeah, reaching out, let's, let's put that down as well. So anything else? Anybody else get some... Um, okay, yeah. What are we doing to prepare the way? I love that. So that's an incredible thought. Um, anyone else? What else kind of disrupted you? What made you feel a bit like... Ugh? What, did this, what was the Spirit saying to you through that passage? Previous, no, sorry. The previous chapter in 52, it talks about how wonderful, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And Jesus refers to himself as the one who has beautiful feet and he brings the, the good news. It's actually the gospel, which is, means good news. Yeah, so it's yeah, good news. And this is a, so this chapter is a really beautiful way of, of kind of saying that good news and salvation. So there's hope, there's hope in this actually, because actually it's quite, it's quite heavy, it's quite sad when you read it, it's quite emotional, but actually there is hope and joy. Anything else? What else sort of sunk through to you? Yes. Peers. Peers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, I love that. It's linked to that. How do we repay that? He was pierced. So he was pierced. If we really let that sink in. How can we repay, re, can we repay that? Okay, anything else? Yeah. Okay, so hitting home that this is this is passages about us. Our sins, yep. Yeah. This is not just an ancient book. This is a living book that is for us right now in two thousand and twenty three, sitting here in Molsey. This is for our sins that he was pierced. Yeah, anything else that kind of disrupted you by the Spirit? Yeah. I love that. Okay, so that was just sort of like just seeing that actually Jesus had this hard start, like so many of us, so many people that we know have had such a hard start in life. But when we look at Jesus and how he surrounded people around him, what, what happened then? And that kind of, that thing that we can relate to that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, amazing. Okay. Okay, anything else? Or it could be the next question. So what, what is the spirit confirming in your heart? Was there something that just was like, oh, Never, never had that in my heart before. But yes, the Spirit confirmed that to me today. It's an overwhelming love Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That whole thing. That it was all because of love. At the end of the day, it's love. Yeah, Tishy. Yeah, we need to pray for more Jewish people to be reading this and to be hit by that. Yeah, scales falling off, yeah. Mm. Yes. Yes, yes. I love that. So sort of discernment and 
I love that reflection of Jesus. We, we are to be a reflection of Jesus in love or in silence. You know, it, I was just reading actually this morning about how our mouths are so small but, and yet they can lead us into so much destruction or love. And we, have that, we need that discernment, like you were just saying, about when to speak and when to not. I think it's quite healthy, actually, to sit in that a bit and sort of to let it affect us because God is an emotional God. You know, we can see that throughout Scripture. He is an emotional God. He doesn't want us to not be emotional. It's actually to feel emotion about this. I think for me, one of the things that was interesting, what came after this kind of crushing, horrible feeling that I was feeling was actually what, um, Ezra, you were talking about the joy of the Lord in your dancing. And um, actually the joy, of, the joy comes through the Lord. And it ends with this kind of after there is something. And then, so after he has suffered in verse 11, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. You know, there is another part to this story. So even through this sort of suffering, there is joy. And joy, you know, that joy comes in the morning. There will be joy. So I'm just going to put joy down because I feel like we... We can't just sit there. We need to... We know the end of the story. Okay, thank you so much, guys, for sharing your heart and being a body and actually let's going through this journey together with the Holy Spirit. It's so special to really sit in God's Word and let it sink in and convict us or or challenge us, or, or move us to tears. That's the power of the living word that we've experienced this morning. So, so thank you, Jesus, for being here right now. Um, and actually, you know, we can see on the board, and maybe when we're worshipping, we can look at these things, and maybe see about what is the Spirit saying to us as a, as a church, or as an individual. You know, what are we doing to prepare the way? How are we being the reflection of Jesus, the love and the care? How can we repay that he was crushed and pierced for our sins? This is good news because it talks about our salvation, the fact that we will not die, but we will have life with Jesus and be satisfied? How are we reaching out to the people that have had a hard start just like Jesus did? How are we bringing them joy like our Father chose our needs above Jesus? How are we going to choose their needs above ours? So as I close now, I'm just going to invite the band back up as we can Spend this next time worshipping our God, worshipping our Jesus who came and was crushed for us so that we could have life. So let's all stand up now and let's just stand in a, in a posture of response. Yeah, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for being here this morning. Jesus, thank you so much that you are living and you are here right now. I pray that things this morning would sink from our head to our hearts, that our lives would be changed for you so that we can go out there and reflect your love and bring people into the truth, telling them the good news. This is good news. So we want to sing to you now, Jesus. 
we give our voices to You. We give our bodies to You. And we say, yes, Jesus, amen to what You've done. Thank You. Thank You for doing this. We love You, Jesus.